Welcome to Confessions of a Stenographer, where we will focus on all things steno and the state of our profession. Thanks for tuning in. I am your host, Shanice Day, founder of Steno in the City and founder of this podcast. I hope you all are staying safe out there. I wish you all nothing but the best. What a year this has been, my Lord. What I can tell you is that greater days are on the way, and I am believing and declaring that for all of us. We are going to jump right into episode eight with our next co-host. Our next guest is a steno game changer. If you don't know what that is, a steno game changer is someone who is passionate about steno and continues to add value and bring new innovative ideas to the profession. As technology continues to evolve, so will steno. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Stanley Sakai. Hey, Stan, welcome to the Steno Podcast. Are you ready to confess? I'm ready to confess. Okay, do your thing. Take it away. Um, So, well, I originally graduated from the University of Washington in Seattle with a degree in linguistics, and I guess academia was never really in the cards for me. So, actually, when I was in my undergrad, I took on Penn Shorthand, uh, Greg Shorthand to be precise, and I was actually taking notes in all of my classes using pen shorthand. And, you know, more than a couple of times, somebody would come up to me and ask me, like, yo, are you writing in, like, a Middle Eastern language to take notes? And I would have to be like, no, actually, this is shorthand. It makes me just write faster. And my first exposure to machine shorthand was um, my first programming class at UW. And so we had live captioners, we had like five deaf people in the class. And, you know, of course, the Curious Academy was like, yo, I, w- I want to know how this works. So I went up to her and, you know, she showed me the machine and let me play with it, let me play with it for a little. And I, you know, tinkered around with it and saw all these words coming up. And I had to know, like, how does this work? Um, like, how do you know where all the keys are? You know, the typical questions were always asked. Um, and so after I learned about that, I was hooked because, you know, with pen shorthand, you have to actually go back and transcribe what you wrote. But with this, you can just let the computer do it your, or do it for you. So I actually went on eBay and bought my first machine, which was basically a hundred dollar machine from Gemini. And then I just kind of started teaching myself. And, you know, before I knew it, I was taking that machine to school and using it to take notes for my college classes, um, almost every single one of them. And after that, I kind of, I found out what, how much captioners make. And so I decided to kind of do it at UW uh, after I graduated until Opportunity found me in New York, and then I moved here. And so, like, after many gigs with tech conferences and um, at a I went, uh, I was captioning for a a coding boot camp, sorry. And that kind of propelled me into taking on coding myself. And that's kind of where it's led me to where I'm now, a software engineer and a stenographer. But yeah, it's kind of random, but anyway. (laughs) Um, How did I hear about court reporting or captioning? Um, I honestly kind of just fell into it, really. Like I said, I was super into pen stenography. And once I had learned about machine steno, it really intrigued me because I no longer had to, like, translate what I had written down. Um, It was just easier because, you know, we've just moved on to digital form. And it was way easier to pull up a file that I had created for a class on my laptop than to have, like, millions of pages of notes. So it, I honestly just kind of fell into it. I never even knew about the profession until I saw that cart captioner in my programming class. So yeah, I just found out that I was good at it and then decided to turn it into a career. Um, What makes, what is a captioner? So to me, a captioner is someone that takes the spoken word and transforms it to written form so closely that it's basically as fast and as comprehensive as being able to actually hear the person. Um, In my experience, like working with deaf people, both 
who are kind of passive in audiences at like conferences or people who actually need that text to interact with people, it has to be as fast and as complete as possible. So at minimal drops, you have to just stay on the speaker and get the message across as fast as possible, um, which you know differs from court reporting because you, you can go back and edit. But to me, it's really the real-time aspect of captioning that makes a captioner. Um, as far as what makes a good captioner, I would say that the most important one or the most important trait of a good captioner is you have to be a fast learner and adaptable because you never really know what you're going to be thrown. You know, people try to help you with prep material. They try to help you with all the emails and stuff, but there's always going to be something that pops up that you either don't know is in your dictionary or you don't actually know the word. So you have to be mental, mentally flexible enough to be like, okay, this sounds like a Middle Eastern word. How would it look if it were spelled that way? Um, you know, among many other things, like if they're doing math, you have to be able to get all the terminology down, all the like variables and letters and stuff, which is not something that normally appears in court dictation. So I would say mentally flexible again and a fast learner. You have, to, you have to be good at technology. <laughs> you know, when it comes down to it, captioners, this is a technological job. Like you have to be able to use your cat software, doesn't matter what it is, just know how to use it well, so that if you happen to come across an error, or if you happen to come across an untranslate, you have to know how to like, just fix that right away. Um, the next I would say is working well under pressure. Um, and you know this this like trait also carries over to the court reporting world, obviously, but I think it's a different kind of pressure because when you're a captioner, it is truly real time, and especially like I said before, when you're dealing with a deaf client who needs to be able to communicate in real time, you have to be fast, and if you're not fast, you might let someone down because they'll lose their opportunity to get a word in because you're behind or one, one of the things that actually like kind of like uh, consumes me is when they tell jokes um, because if you don't get the punchline down fast enough, it's just kind of awkward because, you know, you're laughing and, you know, your client may laugh like two seconds later. Um, but if you're not fast enough, the context of that joke will quickly leave and you won't, it won't make sense to, you or the client so yeah working well under pressure and the final one i would say is you have to be perfectionistic but realistic so i see a lot of or i hear see a lot of captioners say like you know what's the correct way to do this you know how would you do this when you're actually on the job i i think those are great tips on like oh like i would paragraph for this or put a parenthetical here you know like these very like kind of um, nebulous guidelines, but like when you're under pressure, those things might not happen. So you have to be okay with that. You have to be able to accept that what you're outputting is not 100% perfect, but you also have to be perfectionist, perfectionist enough to improve upon your mistakes. If you see a term coming up over and over, I, it's not acceptable in my mind to get it wrong over and over which I've actually heard from my, you know, uh, cart and captioning clients that, yo, I have this captioner who makes the same mistake again and again. So, you know, be perfectionistic to the point where you are willing to learn from your mistakes, but you have to be realistic. Like things are fast. You're always going to be thrown things that you don't know. So just like kind of roll with it and don't be too hard on yourself because at the end of the day, if your mental health is not on point, you're not going to perform your best. And my advice to that is just be empathetic and compassionate to yourself because you're also human. Um, can you explain your role as a software engineer and your coding in Steno? So I originally started Steno obviously doing uh, more traditional things, uh, captioning classes, captioning lectures, captioning conferences, etc. And 
you know, that kind of led into app development, which I'll get into a little bit later, but it kind of like propelled me into this new or a different career. Well, it is new and different, but a different career of being a software engineer. And I just, because I already have Steno in my instinct and I already know how much or I already know how much faster and how much more powerful being able to steno is that it just came pretty natural to me that I would code using steno. Um, I guess like kind of the nuts and bolts of it, you know, you have to be able to come up with lots of different briefs for uh, punctuation, which, you know, for, uh, which for like captioning, you'll normally just be, you're, you'll mostly stick to the basics, like commas and periods and stuff. But in coding, you have to be able to write curly braces, square brackets, uh, back ticks, and all that stuff. So you just have to be creative. And it's just like any other word, like I tell people, um, you know, there's no reason why the way that we write guidelines is TKPWHRAOEUPBZ or whatever. Same thing with uh same thing with per, uh punctuation marks like you can just come up with k l u r b for curly brace or b r k t for square bracket it's just like another word in steno and so now i'm actually working for a large media company as a software developer and i use steno every single day it makes my life easier because not only am i communicating using steno because most of our stuff is you know online now um but it it's, I, it's definitely paid off in the amount of work that I've been able to kind of forego because I can just hit a bunch of keys and have the same thing come out as pecking like 30 keys on a normal keyboard. So it's definitely paying off. And it's a really cool, um, I, I guess, kind of um, feature of being a, an engineer. A lot of people at my company have asked me about it. I've given several demos at our company, um, offsite events and stuff like that. So it's definitely like something that um, I kind of have all, always um, attached to my identity. Like even at my software job, I'm still known as stenographer on Slack. Everyone just knows me as the person who knows steno. So it's never left. I'm still... Even though I'm a software engineer, I'm still a stenographer. I'm still stenographer. Um, so what are the big events or conferences you've captioned? So at the beginning, obviously, I did a lot of classes. I did a lot of um, kind of like one per, you know, one-on-one -on -one events and services for an indiv a deaf individual. But as my career kind of progressed, I did you know, multiple large tech conferences with audiences that can range from the hundreds to the thousands. And, you know, that helped me to kind of like settle my nerves of doing that kind of job. Um, kind of earlier in my career, I also did broadcast captioning, which um, was great for what it was back then. Um, but I quickly found like more fun and more kind of uh, on-brand opportunities. For example, I captioned Michelle Obama's book tour when she made her stop in Tacoma, Washington. And that was really cool. Jimmy Kimmel was on set. Um, it was pretty awesome. And another one was last year, I got to work for Andrew Yang's campaign, which was really interesting because it wasn't necessarily for deaf people. It was more for the social media people who are constantly paying attention to quotables, right? They want to take a quote and immediately put it up on Twitter. Or, you know, we even had graphic designers who were watching the feed. And when they saw something that was a key line, they would just get to work, make it into a t-shirt or some sort of bumper sticker, and it would just go up. Or the social media people would just tweet your work immediately after, you know, throwing in a couple edits. And it was really cool just to like be able to do that and then I had Twitter open on a different pane and just seeing your work pop up on Andrew Yang official. So that was really cool. Um, I also have worked uh, many times for the UN. 
uh, one of which was a job where I was actually, <laughs> okay, so the story goes, the Spanish interpreter didn't show up. I don't know what the details exactly were, but there was no Spanish interpreter. And they asked me if possibly, do you know any Spanish? And I was like, well, yeah, I speak Spanish. And so they they asked me, could you possibly listen to what the speaker is saying and then translate it and put it in text in English on the screen? So obviously I was like, well, like I can try, you know, like being the young, dumb young me, um, which actually worked out okay because I was able to listen and translate and write it out into English steno. Um, but it was tough. And after that, I needed like 10 naps and like three bottles of wine. Um, but yeah, that was kind of like a really cool, I don't know, career milestone, just being able to prove myself that like, oh yeah, I guess you can also listen in Spanish and translate to English. Um, 10 out of 10 would not recommend, <laughs> but it's still, yeah, I would consider that a cool like highlight of my career. Um, and I guess like one of the largest kind of most publicized career events was working for Coachella. So I worked with Isaiah Roberts and we went to Coachella last year, you know, fully everything was just all included. They flew us out, paid for our accommodations on site at the festival. And we were on main stage in the evenings captioning everything that we're saying or everything that the artists were saying and sending it out via an app that I custom made for Coachella, which they basically introduced into their current iPhone, uh, iPhone and Android app that you know everyone has to download anyway for uh, activating their wrist fan, wristbands. So that was like one of the coolest events that I've ever done. And I think that event has really push the bar on what stenographers can do, as well as inspiring a lot of young people who don't have a great idea of how this career works or, you know, the possible kind of like random offshoot, but really freaking cool possibilities that you can take it. And now we'll tune in to the Steno News that you can use. Steno News that you can use. NCAA finished a week of free webinars for Mental Health Awareness Week. The recordings are available to all NCRA members. Mental health is real and self-care should be a top priority for all of us. If you're not a member of NCRA, this would be a good time to join. If you join for the month of October, you will receive 15 months of membership for the price of 12. Or you can join in November and receive 14 months of membership for the price of 12. Next up, we have NCRA Business Summit 2021. Registration is open now. This will go down in Savannah, Georgia. And the dates are, I believe, January 29th through the 31st. So that's what next, that's in a few months. Last but not least, October 20th, this is next week, will be the last day to register for the skills exam test. That will be given between November 1st and no 20, um, November 20th, excuse me. So wait, let me just um, repeat those dates again. So for the skills registration for next month, um, registration is October 20th, with, which is next week. And this will be given um, for the skills exam dates, which are November 1st through the 20th. And so this is the last cycle of the year. So get registered. And that's your steno news that you can use. Digital court reporters, um, my take is basically that as long as they're skilled and can meet this, meet or exceed the same standards as steno writers can, I'm game. I know like there are limitations to speech recognition, right? Which steno writers don't have. And a lot of steno writers kind of congregate on that and, you know, say like, oh, they can't do this. But you also have to realize that there are also limitations to steno and you can't you can't have one without both right so i think that as long as they can produce the same output in the end it's providing a, a type of service and the means aren't so much as important to me i guess as the final product so 
as long as you can do the exact same thing and to the same standards as a steno writer can and by saying like the standards a steno writer can i'm not implying that one is better or more you know faster whatever whatever the argument is than the other but i'm just saying that as long as the product is the same i have no problem with it i'm not tribalist about being a steno writer i'm about providing access to whomever needs it and if there happens to be a voice writer that is in the area right um when there is no steno writer i'm like whatever just do it so yeah as far as do i think that you know speech recognition systems and ai kind of things will take over so my take is i i always like hesitate to give a one answer to this because this is a complicated question you know for several reasons right so like firstly you have to state your definition of what quote take over the steno industry is so do i think they'll take over like high profile high consequence jobs where you know if you mess up it's kind of a big deal it kind of makes your event look shoddy um you know like jobs like caption for Michelle Obama or these highly technical conferences where your real time is like plastered on this giant screen for like a thousand people i would say probably not and i always say probably because i'm i kind of i veer away from superlatives cuz you never know with technology and so i will always say probably not and it's not because i don't have faith in the steno industry or anything i'm just saying that there are a lot of things that we didn't think would happen 30 years ago but there are a lot of things that we thought would happen 30 years ago that have not happened yet and speech recognition just happens to be one of them so we have to realize that also that there's a huge vacuum of new stenographers entering this arena and this is a well known fact and i don't think anyone's going to you know kind of refute that and because of you know the way i don't want to get too in the weeds with this but the way that you know e economics is structured and the way capitalism is structured it kind of dictates that the market will kind of do its thing and so i do think that there will be more opportunities for ai and machine learning in this kind of arena to take over in sort of like i would say less mission critical sectors so for instance offline captioning or transcription you know where a human can go back and edit the output right and you know it does pain me to say this publicly but you know i'm not a person to sugarcoat things i'm i'm pretty realistic both in personality and just you know general outlook in life demeanor and so i do see this you know thing and thing by uh, ai and ml based uh transcription systems becoming i guess a quote unquote threat to uh certain segments of the steno industry which like i said are like the low the less mission critical things however but however i think to differentiate ourselves from that cheaper alternative it's critical that we as stenos uh, it's critical that we as steno writers earn the trust of our consumers as a more accurate, quicker and just all around better option so that the cost of having to hire a much more expensive stenographer like us outweighs the benefits of the cheaper and currently inferior output of AI and ML based transcription systems where a human will eventually have to go back and edit all of that. So you know if you're transcribing for something that's not as pressing as like a super live event or a super live and super high visibility event yes i think that there's going to be some creep like that's just kind of where things are headed but like for the truly like you know if you make a a steno a typo <laughs> what would be the steno equivalent of typo um you know the ones that where a typo would severely affect the reputation and performance of an event that's not going anywhere because humans have context 
we, we can look at slides and we can make it look the way that it should, especially for an entire room of experts. So that's not going anywhere. Um, and I guess like my advice to anyone uh, pursuing this is to always just be flexible, be, you know, constantly learning. And if you do that, you'll achieve greatness and these won't be a threat. They'll only be a threat to lower standard jobs, which like, you know, there's always a room for, like everyone has to grow, everyone has to do to get to that point. Um, but I, I will say for now that if you always strive for excellence, then you're gonna be fine. Like bar none, done. Um, as far as what advice I would give to students that are just starting in this profession, I would say have an open mind because the traditional path kind of dictates to us that, oh, you're gonna get certified and then you're gonna work for an agency and then you might go freelance and yada, yada, yada. It's kind of like this predetermined tra trajectory. And my trajectory has been so far away from that um, that I can, you know, as like a first person testimony, just say that you don't have to follow that trajectory. You can make it what you want. Like I happen to love electronic music and going to concerts. And I found someone, Isaiah, who is also into that. And we made it to Coachella. Like you don't know where it'll take you. You can't always just like harp on being, you know, you can't always just like occupy your mind with like, when am I gonna pass the next test? How am I gonna do it? Like, blah, blah. There's just so much anxiety around testing in the steno world. And I'm like, you know, like it's always, you know, I will always say that you should get certified if you can, if it's in your mental bandwidth, your professional bandwidth, what have you. But you know, like it's not the key to success. And I started working before I was certified and then eventually got it, of course. But it's not something that defines you. It's not something that will make or break you, honestly. And you just have to get your name out there. You have to get your reputation out there. And, you know, at the end of the day, it really comes down to, are you a cool person to work with? Because if you have the skill, then people will want to work with you if you're cool to work with. So like, I think also in addition to getting certified, work on your people skills be able to communicate, be able to solve problems and help. And that's really it. Um, but again, caveat, you should get certified if you can, and you should keep working on your whatever test anxiety. Um, I had it so many times. If you looked at my NCRA transcript, you'd probably think I was a failure. But <laughs> um, I like to believe I'm not a failure. So I'm just like, you know, if you have the focus and the discipline to become the best that you can be, let that shine through first. And then when you are mentally ready and, you know, emotionally, psychologically, and physically ready to be able to pass a national or state test, then that's where you should go. But only when you're ready, right? And again, it doesn't define you just kind of like do your thing until you're ready for it. And I think a lot of people just jump the gun and are like, this is the next step. This is where I have to go next. I have to pass the test, this test or else I'm not going to get a job, blah, blah. You know, I just read through these Facebook groups and people are just like panicking. And I'm like, guys, just, or y'all just kind of like take a step back and, you know, think about where, how far you've already come and just it's just another bump in the road and once you're like 20 years down the line you're not gonna even think about it because honestly it was just one thing right so have an open mind don't be afraid of technology oh and always ask for help if you need it because so many people of course this is just my personal experience but so many people just get stuck in their own kind of head and trying to just push through and you know, just doing the same thing over and over. But a lot of times when you are 
practicing by yourself and listening to dictation, you don't see your blind spots. And I think that's a great time when you are stuck, when you truly feel like you're not progressing to reach out and ask someone you know or someone you perhaps don't know um, for help because everyone needs help. Like you, no one gets to anywhere by themselves completely. Um, so I, I think getting rid of that shame, being less anxious about it and just kind of like letting the journey be what it is instead of like making the destination like the defining feature of you i think that's that is really helpful and that certainly helped me when i was like failing all these tests over and over and over um to just like reach out and kind of like let people know where you're at um you know on facebook or wherever you know even better if someone near you is also going through the same thing with steno training but you know like just reach out and be a person and, you know, forgive yourself for being a human, right? Um, so during this pandemic, uh, for the most part, at least toward the beginning, I was, uh, I will admit I was in a mentally uh, less optimal state. So I kind of stuck, stuck to my own with my developer job. I didn't take as many captioning jobs because I just did not have the cognitive bandwidth to handle scheduling, you know, multiple different clients on top of you know, everything that was happening with my programming job. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm now like a year and a couple months into this job, so I'm fairly new. So there were a lot of things that I had to learn, you know, things had not become automatic for me yet. So... I had to kind of devote most of my attention to programming, but you know, now as things have opened up and I've gotten better at programming, there, you know, there's a lot more room for me to fit in captioning and I've slowly begun to kind of like add it back in, which has been great. Um, but you know, like, you know, as the pandemic wore on, it became clear to me how much opportunity there was in the captioning world, you know, now that everything is online, and I've been kind of flooded, honestly, with emails and requests because a lot of uh, cart captioners are now taken up by the schools because, you know, it's fall and things are starting up and they're all just like doing academic work. So all the like small events, the one offs here and there are just like, well, we have no one else to go to. And I'm like. I, I do want to kind of say that I'm like the only one in New York that is not doing that, uh, i.e. has like a normal academic schedule. So I'm able to actually take on these like small like, oh, can you do a one o'clock here, a 10 a.m. here, blah, blah. Um, but like the volume of work that's just come out of the result of <laughs> everything going online is, you know, at least from the testimonies of my colleagues, kind of unmatched. Unimag or at least from the testimony of my colleague, kind of unmanageable. So I've been doing what I can to kind of pitch in for that kind of work and help out a couple deaf people or just events in general. Um, so yeah, I've mostly been on um, programming, but I'm kind of back in the game now. Um, advice that I would give stenographers that want to leave the courtroom or freelance world and start captioning i would say you know i i mentioned before being like open-minded being flexible being technically competent or technologically comp competent um but i would say that if you are a person that feels more encumbered i guess by like the procedures and the formality of legal work then captioning is definitely a good uh, option for you. Uh, if you enjoy kind of learning about random things and kind of diving into a subject that you may or may not have, ex have had exposure to, then yeah, captioning is definitely for you. Um, I know a lot of stenographers who like being, or having work that's predictable. So they go in the courtroom, it's legal dictation, it's in their wheelhouse, they know what you know, more or less what to expect. Of course, there's going to be differences. But I would say, like, if you are 
I don't know. So I'm ADHD. And if you have ADHD, I think captioning is a great job for you because it sets your schedule. You have to sit down, you have to concentrate, and then you have to learn about all these like, you know, random things depending on whatever you're captioning. So I think it's a great job if you have ADHD. Um, so yeah, if you're more creative, if you're kind of like, ugh, such stodgy procedures, blah, blah, in the courtroom, I would say like captioning is a great kind of alternative career and it pays really well. So like go for it, right? A little less than a month ago, I started posting on TikTok and um, I didn't, I honestly didn't expect it to blow up. You know, if I got a hundred views on my video, I would have been like, A okay, <laughs> having a great time. But little did I know that my first video would get 1.3 million views and basically quarter million likes. I think it's more than that now. And yesterday I posted another video, which is now at 300,000 views. Um, <laughs> I, so I just wanted to talk about TikTok as kind of like just me doing my thing. I never intended it for, I, I never intended for it to like blow up the way that it did. I didn't do anything intentional really to kind of rig the system or make it blow up the way that it did. I just went on and explained like, oh, I'm on a call with Andrew Yang and Daniel Day Kim. And then in subsequent videos, people asked lots, lots of questions in the comments. And, you know, every time I responded to one, you know, I would look at the rankings and see like, okay, this one had the most likes. And then I would choose that one as my next video topic. And I, I don't know what it is. Like, I just I just feel like I'm dancing like a monkey in front of my phone every night because it's you know kind of it's kind of like a um evening routine for me um I can pump out I can crank out like a TikTok video in the same time it takes me to rot to watch an episode of Ratchet which is like an hour so like you know it's it's very sustainable for me but like I just go on and talk about things that people are, I guess, truly fascinated by. Like, what do closed captioners do when we hear a word that we don't know? Or what do we do when we make a typo kind of thing? Because most people just don't know how it works. And, you know, like, everyone's just asking, like, I don't, I, I've gotten at least, like, a thousand questions, or as in a thousand times the question asked, like, how does the keyboard work? And I'm like, I already put out a video about it, yo. But like, people are truly fascinated by what we do. And I kind of took that, or I didn't take it for granted, but I kind of wrote it off, right? I didn't think that anyone really would be that interested in a stenography keyboard and blah, blah. And I was definitely inspired by um, Isabel Lumsden's videos. She's also a TikToker and she reached like 300, or 3 million views or something like that, something crazy. Um, and now we're like talking on social media, but it, I guess like people really want to hear about what we have to say and what we do. So kind of just riding the wave, you know, mostly just being myself and dancing around in front of my phone. But hey, if people like it, then, you know, publicity for us. And, you know, it's just fun for me, honestly. And, you know, like, I've been a reporter for, oh, God, I think it's actually seven years now. Yeah, it's October, because I got my CSR in Washington in October of 2012. Wait, did I do the math right? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, like, um, relative to a lot of people I know, that's an absolute steno baby, <laughs> like, I wouldn't consider myself experienced in any measure of the word when, you know, there are people who have stenoed longer than I've been on this earth. But yeah, like I, I really enjoy being kind of the, um, I don't want to say steno expert, but the professional on social media. Cause you know, a lot of social media people or people who use like TikTok and Instagram to pr promote 
what they're learning in school and stuff, they're, they tend to be younger and, you know, hence tend to have less experience. And so a lot of them are just explaining what they're doing in school and how like the basic mechanics of STEM works. And so I kind of like thought, well, because I have more experience and, you know, I guess I'm still at the age where I'm like, it still isn't like uncool if I did TikTok that I would bring kind of more of a professional aspect to it that like, this is like how, this is why like captioning is so far behind because I've actually had the experience of having to connect to an encoder via modem and then watching like the output on TV come out, you know, like three minutes later, <laughs> well, not three minutes, but I, I wanted to put a more professional spin to it. Like what is it actually you know, what, what is it like to ask a person who actually has done this for a while kind of thing? Um, so yeah, like I, again, I just think TikTok is something that's fun and I just kind of bring my personality to it and I guess people like it. So I'm going to keep doing it. Um, and it helps the profession. And, you know, I was uh, nominated to be one of the branded brand ambassadors for NCRA. So like, this is my contribution, okay? So anyway, um, as far as my hobbies, uh, I really like languages. So I tend to spend at least like an hour studying some sort of random language, or I, I tend to spend at least an hour studying some sort of language. Um, my current languages are English, Spanish, Korean, Japanese, Dutch, and American Sign Language but I've been slowly learning French every single day, um, you know, little bite-sized pieces at a time, and also learning one or two kanji a day, uh, basically Chinese characters that Japanese people use, because I really suck at reading Japanese, so I like, big, I like to uh, tell myself I'm getting better at it. Um, another one that I really wasn't that into, but now I am, is cooking. Um, and I don't know, it was kind of like spearheaded by my parents sending me a bunch of care packages with like random Korean ingredients and stuff because, uh, I grew up basically with, uh, Korean cuisine or Korean, Japanese, uh, American, I don't even know, kind of fusion cuisine. So I've been like replicating that a lot at home, you know, due to the pandemic and it's kind of just like open my mind to like how much money I save not going out to New York restaurants and spending, you know, 20, $30 every single meal. So that's like another one. Um, uh, above that, I also kind of, <laughs> this is going to kind of sound silly, but I'm on Robin hood and I've been stock trading um, because you know, what else are you going to do? <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I, I Maybe I have a problem with like slot machine logic with these apps. Like I love like TikTok because it gives you likes and Robinhood because it gives you, you know, you can actually check in um, minute to minute how your stocks are doing and just watching that number grow is just kind of addicting to me. So I, I, I maybe this is a larger theme, but yeah, trading stocks is something that I've become, uh, that's become a hobby of mine. Um, and another one is just like making apps. So um, I, you know, obviously like now that I'm a software engineer, I can use that skill to either make an app for myself or um, help others develop out their ideas. Um, so I've been working on a couple of freelance projects as well as developing out Upwardly, which is like my version of, uh, which is basically like an, a cloud-based uh, captioning platform. So yeah, lots of little things that I've been working on, but all able to be done within the comfort of my apartment. You know, perfect pandemic activities. Do I have any words to live by or encouraging words that I would like to share with the profession? I would say the main thing is forget the naysayers because there are just so many of them and people just like get butt hurt all the time and you know that 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 includes both people in the profession as well as um people from the outside and you know once you encounter a naysayer it could be you know mentally debilitating it could be 
very discouraging to be like, well, you know, Siri is getting good and Alexa is getting really good. Like, are you worried about your job kind of thing? And, you know, it gets really exhausting having to fight back every single time because everyone seems to have that question, right? So, you know, what I say is like, just forget the naysayers and do your best. And there will always be people trying to one-up you and tell you that we're about to be obsolete and like, here are all the reasons and la la la. You know, like, obviously I can't predict the future. I can't tell you if whether or not we're gonna be obsolete. I can just say that this is what I observe. But the best thing to do is just keep a smile on your face and know that you're excellent and just keep on keeping on with your talents. Because like I said before, if you strive for and achieve excellence, you're gonna stand out. No matter what you do, because you're good, you're gonna be, you're gonna provide enough value to overcome all these kind of intruders, like all the like machine learning um, based cheaper alternatives to Steno. So I just say like, just keep being you, be awesome. And also though, keep a smile on your face, be better than they are. And if they say something that, you know, pisses you off, that make, that kind of puts you down, feel sorry for them. Don't be, you don't have to be like, you know, cantankerous or, you know, you know, rude to them. Just be like, oh, I, you know, I'm sorry you feel that way. And this is why I don't think my job's going to be taken over. But like, you don't really have to prove it to anyone. Just keep doing you, do what you do well, and just, you know, you know, do you, just do you, go off and do you. Because you don't have to prove to anyone except for yourself. And I, I don't know how many times I've had to have this conversation. I don't know how many times I've had to have this conversation, but like, I'm just like, you know what? I really don't care what you think because I'm, I don't have time or the money to sit here and argue with you because I'm too busy, like actually doing things. All right. So like, you know what? Like, okay. If you think this is going to be like outdated because of Siri or whatever, just whatever. That's cool. Here's why I think I'm going to be around. Bye. You know, so just like, don't let it get to you. And just, again, keep on doing you and being great at it. Um, when the pandemic is over, one thing that I'm going to be really excited to participate in again is going back to concerts. Like I mentioned, I love electronic music and I love <laughs> mass gatherings, um, which is funny because like now that with like my kind of COVID programming, I just think back to like the stuff we would do at concerts and I'm like, wow, that's so unsanitary. And so just like, ah. um, but you know, like I will be so excited for the time where I can go back to a concert, you know, be back meeting with my friends, hanging out with them in, in mass. So I'm really excited about that. And um, I really hope that, you know, our country and everyone else gets their things together so we can do that. But, you know, until then, you know, it's out of my, our control. So we just got to keep doing what we do and hopefully try to find meaning out of it. So yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> I think that's the end. Thank you. So first of all, you just made me um, flashback to last year here in Denver, um, after the gala, um, you and Isaiah um, put together the, we went to, um, we went, well, we went out Saturday yeah. night yeah. and we were out and we had a great time. That was that an was amazing so, evening. That was so bad. Right. So I cannot wait. Hopefully we'll get to do that in Vegas again. Um, Hopefully, yes. A, yeah, I know. I don't know how it's going to be with the whole social distancing thing, but mm -hmm. we all deserve it for next year. We have to make sure. up since we weren't able to, you know, go to Orlando. So for you sure. have said a lot 
um, the Gippin <laughs> naysayers. Just, I'm so proud of you. I love you. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep promoting. Um, you're just, and you, you said six years. You are well, definitely a steno game changer. And <laughs> I know you are. And I appreciate you. you. You're welcome. So, Stan, I want to thank you for being on Confessions of a Stenographer. And I want to thank you for confessing. Thank you. Oh, my God. This was a great opportunity. And, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to share, of, you know, as suggested by my social media habits. But, you know, anything I can do with my personality and what I've, what I've uh, been able to achieve in my small time, very short time in the steno community, I'd love to just contribute and let everyone know that, you know, there's always a way to make it work. So... Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. I would like to thank everyone that took the time out to tune in to the eighth episode of this dinner podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or topics that you would like to hear on Confessions of a Stenographer, where we will focus on all things steno, you can send an email, email to the steno podcast at gmail.com. And remember, this platform was designed for all of us. I am determined and will continue to add value to our profession. We are the highly skilled stenographers, and it is time that we recognize our work. As technology evolves, so will stenography. We are here to stay, and we will continue to run our race. Until then, stay encouraged, and don't forget to vote. Good night.